Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of The Negotiation. In this episode, we speak with a dear friend of mine, Elise Ribbons, a startup founder, radio show host, actor, and writer in China, who is also incredibly fluent in Mandarin. She is the founder of Cheeky Monkey Theater and host of the nationally syndicated news talk show, Lao Wai Kandian. She kicks off the conversation talking about what drew her to China all the way back in 2001 and how she was able to achieve an impressive level of fluency in Mandarin, having just passed HSK 6. Aside from her work in theater, Elise has also been cast in a number of Chinese films. All of this gives her a unique perspective on the local entertainment industry that most foreigners never get a chance to see. She speaks on her various opportunities to work in the Chinese movie industry and along the way touches on how the culture of speed in China's business world influences even the entertainment sphere. Enjoy. Fan Xing, the founder of Star Theater, he's a businessman. And there's so few people, especially in China, who do business and art, especially theater art. Broadway is a business. Broadway is not pure art. So you have to be able to understand business to do good shows because otherwise, you know, there's a small audience count that's going to like any sort of very niche thing. But if you create entertainment that's really entertaining and, and also artistic, then the audience is bigger. So they create these shows and then they refine them over and over again, the way that good theater is meant to be done. I really like it and I really support it. And they've opened up a new complex here in Chengdu at Dongjiao Jiyi. And so I'm very excited to take over their theaters here and work with them. Home to over 4 billion people, the Asia Pacific region boasts one of the most powerful consumer markets on the planet. Not only is it home to half the world's under 30 population, but it's also home to more than half the world's internet users. It's a market no globally minded brand should ignore, but entering markets like China is no easy task. Just ask the likes of Microsoft, Google, Uber, and Facebook. Times are changing, and with the right partners, doors are slowly opening as more and more companies find success expanding into the markets of the Middle Kingdom. I myself spent eight years in China, mostly as a venture capitalist, helping early stage tech companies enter the Asia Pacific market market successfully. This show is dedicated to uncovering and examining successful China entry and growth strategies by interviewing the people behind those success stories. My name is Todd Embley and welcome to The Negotiation, brought to you by WPIC Marketing and Technologies. Elise, welcome to the show. Good to have you on. Hey, nice to be here. All right. So as we usually do, quick introduction into yourself and how did you end up in China? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, that's my gut reaction when doing the zuo介绍, you know, the, the self-introduction. Uh, um, I hate the self-introduction uh, because it's a weird one. It's long. It's hard to just say, I'm Elise from here because I, I was born in Detroit. And then as a teen, I moved to North Carolina. And then in college, I was studying Arabic. So naturally, I wound up in Beijing to study abroad and then fell in love with the place, switched majors, and then moved over during SARS. That's how I ended up in China. Where did you end up first? Beijing. Went straight to a lot of things. Yeah. But you are, quite obviously, fantastically fluent (laughs) in Mandarin. And we're going to get into a lot of things that that you've done that has either helped you learn your your Mandarin or you've learned your Mandarin to do those things. But tell us a little bit about some of those early days, like your your fluency and, and how did you get there? To start, I did just take the HSK-6, which is the highest level exam. It's for Chinese language teachers, for Chinese people. Right. Chinese. Yeah, that is the opposite of the TOEFL. Yes, exactly. And I, and I passed it. And so I can officially say now that I have the best Chinese um, no, but because, um, you know, for years, I often hear other expats say, oh, yeah, I'm fluent in Mandarin. I'm like, really, dude, really, really? How, how many how many tongue poems can you quote me? Come on. You know, um, just because I spent so many painful hours. I mean, studying for the HSK was a very terrifying experience because it's uh, Chinese testing has, you know, like a millennia of you know, experience sort of just making horrible, painful, torturous tests. So it was not a fun experience. Um, But removing the HSK stuff aside, everything else about studying Chinese has actually been incredibly fun. And there's one main reason for that. And that's because Chinese people are all really, really excited that 
you as a foreigner are studying Chinese and they're all willing to be a teacher of sorts. Genuinely, like when anytime I'm bored anywhere in a cab, on a subway, in line for my COVID test, I can talk to the people around me. And, you know, even if we're just talking about some Chinese language stuff, it's always fun. Everyone enjoys it and I get to learn stuff. And in fact, there is a Confucian saying that where there are three people walking, um, one of them will be my teacher. Right. So be a washer. Yeah, I think. Yeah. But yeah. So when I first arrived in China, I had studied a semester of Mandarin at UNC Chapel Hill and um, knew nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. But it was an intensive uh, language program with CET. And uh, we all had Chinese roommates. And at the beginning, I could not communicate with my roommate, Ting Ting, like at all. Uh, it was embarrassing. Um, but uh, we had a weekend in Qingdao after about a month of intense language classes. And we were not allowed to speak any English over that weekend. And uh, anytime we spoke, said a single English word, we were, you know, Fakwa. And we had, you know, we were punished with five, no, 10 renminbi. And back then, I'm old now, um, back then 10 renminbi was a lot. And so, um, you know, we, we tried not to. And I remember that weekend being the breakthrough point for me because I went from stumbling individual words to being able to actually communicate. Now, I mean, I wasn't speaking perfectly or anything, but I could say, I am thirsty. I would like some water. Where is the bathroom, please? Like all of these important things that you need to survive um, until you're forced to actually use them. It's very easy for them to always like be fluttering up in your head somewhere as a foreign language. But once you use them to survive, to live, they become your language. And, um, you know, I, I continued on studying for many, many years and would every once in a while do a you know, an intensive language weekend of my own, you know, just where I would tell my friends, um, I'm only doing Chinese this weekend, only listening to Chinese music, seeing Chinese movies, only speaking in Chinese. Um, and my friends were often supportive. Um, even in America, I did this, uh, you know, last year during COVID, I did it for a weekend and, uh, people were very supportive and, um, it just, every time I do it, my, my language skills improve even more. So it's a, I highly recommend it for any language you learn. I often tell Chinese friends who are trying to get over that hump in English, you just have to self-impose it a, a weekend where you're not exposing yourself to any of your native language, only that, that new language. And it, it will become your own. And that's the key to the extent where I actually wrote a play many years later um, called Green Eyes on Chinese. And it was about um, the experience of developing another id you know, another whole personality that is my Chinese side, because once that language becomes yours, you think in it, you know, it alters the way you, you know, parse the world. And, um, you know, on stage, it was me and a Chinese woman sort of acting it out. And they were both me. Um, but afterwards, a lot of the audience members came up to me, the Chinese audience members, and were like, that is exactly what it was like for me when I studied English. I thought I was going crazy. I didn't know anyone else did this. And I was like, yes. Yeah, um, so it's a, you know, I think I am curious actually about Canadians because so many of you are bilingual. Um, you know, how, how, how many of you have a, a French alter ego and an English alter ego? I don't know if it's an alter ego, but then also I come from the far West. So, and I'm quite honestly the furthest from, from being bilingual. So, <laughs> but I, but I've, I've, I've heard that and I have, I've noticed drastic changes even being in China when I'm hanging out with Chinese, the way they are and their their persona when in an English environment and speaking and conversing and communicating in English mm -hmm. versus when they are, I don't know any other way to put it, put on their Chinese persona, mm -hmm. like like almost like a like changed, they changed wardrobe something yeah and it yeah, was no, it's like a whole and, face change uh, and it's not i don't yeah everything with the, the thing to do with their hands their 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 posture their facial expressions like everything is so different i'm like who is this person no it's it's so true so true because so much of mm -hmm. the li yi, the way you defer to people the way you connect with people and communicate it's just so different in chinese um so they'd say that that the key to really doing well in China, um, whatever you're doing really is around language. The, the key to understanding a culture and being able to be a part of that culture lies within the language. But here we are talking about 
much more than that. Do mm-hmm. you think it's much more than that? It is. It is. I have no, I mean, honestly, most of my friends who do, you know, who are non-ethnic Chinese people doing business successfully in China, most of them do speak Chinese, at least to some level. Um, while they might not speak as, as well as I do, they get the language and culture a lot more um, than they might think even. Uh, my uh, One of my exes, a wonderful man named Paul Atherley. He ran a uh, gold mine in Heilongjiang. Uh, I think at the time, and maybe even still, the only foreign mining company to actually leave China with a profit. Um, for years, he didn't want to bother to learn Chinese because he, you know, he had translators, assistants, do all this stuff. And then he finally did um, in his 50s start to learn Mandarin. And he learned it very quickly because he was in the environment. You know, he did a an intensive, I think, week-long course in Shijiazhuang and like really did well. And then, you know, afterwards it sort of like clicked for him. He, he got things a lot more. And um, I mean, I'm not saying that's why he earned $30 million or whatever, but I mean, correlation causation, you, you know, <laughs> but I, honestly, there's so much to the, the tone and, and understanding when something is not being spoken. You know, I have the benefit that because I'm not Asian looking, I can always ask, but you have to know to even ask. An example is someone says something and on face value, it means A, but you're like, that's weird. There's something that doesn't quite sit right. They definitely mean something else, but what do they mean? And I can ask, I just say, hey, sorry to be the the oblivious foreigner, but please tell me what does this mean? And the thing is that this is true for all Chinese people. They don't always get what they're the 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 hua, you know hua ne the hua right. They don't get the 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 stuff that's being unspoken, and that was one of the reasons I did so well at the Chinese construction company because they would get me to ask the question because they couldn't lose the face. They couldn't say I don't know what you're talking about. What do you mean? But they could get you know the the dumb foreigner to play the dumb foreigner. The Chinese construction company that we are going to talk about in the future. Yes, Sorry, we haven't podcast. talked about it yet. We haven't, we haven't got there yet. We haven't got there yet, but we're going to. with me is a little bit like that movie Memento, right? Or things are, oh no, Arrival. It's the movie Arrival. Things are out of place that at some point it'll make sense. I promise. That's right. And you're, it's funny because you were talking about the, the, uh, the screenplay that you wrote and the, you know, the, the green eyes. And I just, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Big Trouble in Little China. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's and it's funny because you're mentioning, you, you just said for those, it's a podcast so people can't see you. Mm. You don't look Chinese and you are somewhat the opposite of Chinese. You are, you know, blonde haired, fair, you fair skinned, light eyed, uh, Southern Belle. Yes, you are very much not, <laughs> not yeah. even close. Yeah. So often the, I have to deal with the whole jaw dropping on the floor thing before people will start talking to me, you know, cause I'll, I'll mm-hmm. talk to them and then they're just like, what, what? Like they've seen a ghost honestly had a, a guy scream once at a, uh, like an art event. Cause it was in, you know, an old broken down sort of factory area. And it was sort of, um, in the shadows. And I was asking him, um, if he knew where someone was and he turned around and saw me cause it, you know, he'd heard my voice and he turned around and saw me and he couldn't believe that I was a, you know, a white person talking to him. He like he he literally screamed. I was like, well, I didn't didn't know I had that effect. <laughs> well, and that visual can sometimes disrupt. They can't hear past their, what they're seeing. Right. But the problem with that is, is that, you know, it is it is disruptive to the extent where it takes. So I often say to people, it takes a while to be seen as a person. Do you do you know what I mean? Because it's like people are so distracted by the fact that you're a foreigner and you're a foreigner. You're not a person. You're a foreigner. And eventually people will figure out that, no, you're a person so that they can actually communicate with you. It's the subconscious profiling. It's like if we could all walk around looking like mannequins until you got to know us and only through getting to know us was Mm -hmm. how we looked revealed to you. So you would only recognize people on the street. If you knew that, that you knew because everyone else would just look like a mannequin. You wouldn't be able to a black mirror episode like that, because if not, I think that, that you should write one because that's that's a fantasy future. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's that is kind of cool. Even as I was thinking and saying it, I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's actually really interesting. But I'm not the writer. You are. And part of the stuff that you have done in the past is being part of the Cheeky Monkey Theater troupe. 
Yes. Right? So yeah. I want to ask you, what is, uh, tell everybody, what is the Cheeky Monkey uh, Theater Troupe? What kind of performances does it do? What are some of the major accomplishments? And then once you've kind of broken all that down for us, talk to us a little bit about the content and how it resonated with local Chinese as well. Okay, so Cheeky Monkey Theater was um, mostly comedic, but some drama based theater company. We did um, a lot of improv and um, a lot of like song and dance shows, as well as uh, plays. And we organized several big theater festivals, one of which uh, we did the Bui Lohu with, um, oh God, what's his name? Oh, he's one of those, you know. Oh my God, we're going to, okay. I don't want to sound like too much of an idiot. He did the song with Fergie. He was one of those people. He's into the startup tech stuff. You know, you know, Fergie licious. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know who you're He was one of the people in that Um, band, Black Eyed Peas. Oh, like Will I Am? Yes, Will I Am. Yeah. So Will I Am was a big headliner and the Bui Lohu, because Bui Lohu is a Confucian saying, it was this big cultural event. between, you know, uh, American and Chinese cultural creators in, in Beijing. It was just so much fun. We did the theater festival of it and it was just oh, wonderful. I, uh, you know, we, we did a lot of different material, but often the compliment that I loved the most was that people would say, oh, it's like watching a, an American sitcom on stage. It's so much fun. <laughs> um, and I knew it was still good theater because I still had people sending me threatening emails afterwards, you know, <laughs> so clearly the characters still hit home and, I, and it's still art, um, despite the, you know, the sitcom value. Um, and this was in Beijing. Yeah, mostly in Beijing. We did some plays elsewhere. Um, we helped to produce, uh, some of the stuff for the, uh, the World Expo in Shanghai in 2010. Uh, we did a lot of stuff with the Inner Mongolian government. So they had some pretty cool um, musical theater stuff because we, you know, utilized traditional Mongolian music culture and dance culture and played with it. It was really cool. But mostly, yeah, we, we played. We had fun. That was the whole point of Cheeky Monkey. We had fun. I, um, I always had another job to help sort of support the theater company because theater companies themselves don't make money. And specifically in China, they don't. <laughs> um, but our plays always paid for themselves, if that makes sense. It actually segues into something else that I wanted to talk about is I'm, I'm joining up with Star Theater Company and Cheeky Monkey will become part of theirs. And what is Star Theater Company? So Star Theater started as a complex in Beijing uh, near Shouman subway station. They've got this old courtyard they turned into a couple of black box theaters and they produce, you know, they have an in-house team of actors and directors and writers and they produce really cool avant-garde, but still entertaining plays. And I say this because so much of modern theater in China is just really self-congratulatory artistic meh, you know, like no one enjoys it. People go see it because it's artsy and edgy. Right. But, um, Fan Xing, the, you know, founder of star theater, he's a businessman. Right. And, and there's so few people, especially in China who, uh, do business and art, especially theater art, you know, like Broadway is a business. Broadway is not pure art. So you have to be able to understand business to do good shows because otherwise, you know, there's a small audience, you know, audience count that's going to like any sort of very niche thing. But if you create entertainment, that's really entertaining and and also artistic, then the audience is bigger in it. And so they create these shows and then they refine them over and over again, the way that good theater is meant to be done. And uh, I really like it and I really support it. And they've opened up a new complex here in Chengdu, um, at Dongjiao Ji, which is also sort of like 798 compound here. And so I'm very excited to take over their theaters here and work with them. Some more. Yeah, 798, very, very artistic. I don't know how you would describe it up up in, in Beijing. And uh, I'm not saying it properly because, you know, when you're talking to somebody who knows Mandarin as well as you do, you can't just say Beijing. You're not, you are not capable of saying Beijing. You have to say Beijing. Uh. <laughs> yeah, and you know it's not hard. I I would forgive if people just said Beijing, Beijing or Beijing, but the thing that I can't understand, like Rachel Maddow, she is amazing. She's so intelligent, and yet she pretends that Beijing is a French word, and she says Beijing, and I'm like, it's not. Like, 
Jingle bells. So dear audience members listening to this podcast, I hope you come away with at least one thing. And that is Beijing like jingle bells. It's Thank true. You. It's true. <laughs> and if somebody's name is A-N-G, don't call it Wang. It's not Wang. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so bad for all that. I'm like, it's Wong. It's Young. It's not. <laughs> it's, but that's OK. I mean, give us a now. Now we're really coming across as pompous. So we're, we're going to back that up. Wait, what? <laughs> You know, we've we've earned it. Oh my gosh, have we ever? <laughs> and I know that you know you have earned you've earned a lot of stripes uh, in China, doing a lot of different things as well. Let's get into let's talk about the Chinese cinema scene because you have mm-hmm. uh, you're an actress. You've been a part of something that very very few foreigners ever get to do, which is a part of the local Chinese um, theater and movie and cinema scene in China. Tell us a little bit about how you got into it and then what you've done and what your thoughts are on Chinese cinema. Okay, so well, let's remove theater, the theater element from that, because there's a whole Peking Opera no, thing. No, that's we right. And we will, because you have an MFA in, in Peking Opera. Okay. So we're going to talk about that later, as well as the radio show and stuff like that. But let's just focus on the Chinese cinema for now. Okay, so um, I was in what is perhaps, I believe, the biggest blockbuster to come out of Asia but um, definitely China. Um, I don't want, the, I don't remember what the numbers are right now, but it was called the 800. Um, and it was a movie that was just politically sensitive enough that it was really exciting. And it was, um, it actually, you know, postponed for a whole year of extra edits to refine it. Um, and I unfortunately had a couple of scenes cut during those edits um, because, you know, <sighs> sensitivities. Um but even so, um, many of my scenes still made it. And um, it's a great film. Like genuinely, it's a it's it's something I'm very proud to have been a part of because I've been in a lot of really like I'm in a show right now that I regret being in. I took the role because I get to play an evil British woman. And, you know, like what's more fun than that? Like literally one of one of my lines is uh, how does it go? Um What is going on here? Why won't anyone tell me? And why doesn't anyone respect me? Literally, that's one of my lines. It's it's that ridiculous. So it's like campy and fun. I'm I'm being my inner drag queen for that show. So that's it. but the 800 is like it's a beautiful film. Like the cinematography is good. It's an international uh, crew. The director is Chinese Guanhu. He's really awesome. Um, like very artistic, and he gets into it. And he spent time with every single person who had lines, like going through with us what our character is, the the motivation behind it. And most directors are not that methodical. And, um, it was really cool. There was a scene where I'm crossing the bridge. I play a German. So I'm, I'm crossing this bridge from the Japanese side to the, uh, the Chinese side in Shanghai and, um, underneath a Nazi flag. (laughs) So many times I played Nazis in movies. It's horrible. Um, and, uh, the part of the bridge explodes while I'm crossing and actually my foot gets really messed up. No joke. Um, but they were really nice to me about moving my scenes. I didn't have to run on the bridge anymore, but, um, the, the name of the movie actually comes from my line because I'm the dumb foreigner. <laughs> um, and I misunderstand one of the soldiers because I'm, there's a sort of a journalist I'm bringing supplies and I'm asking them questions like how many soldiers are there here? And uh, the guy says a different number, like, I think maybe like 18 or something. And I'm like, 800. And he's like, yes, yes, 800. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I, I report back you know, and, and write, you know, articles about it being 800 soldiers in this one building. And so the Japanese don't dare attack because they think they'd be, you know, outnumbered. Yeah. Um, but I won't ruin the movie, but it, it is it actually, I, I would say probably the one of the best films out of China. Now, it doesn't necessarily appeal to an international audience the same way that, um, you know, like Zhang Yimou's earlier movies did. Um But it's it's a it's a good movie. It's a solid war film if you're into war films. Okay, how can you can you talk to us? And and I don't know if you can juxtapose North American cinema, like just the 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 writing, the directing, the 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 cinematography, you know, any of that is is there a broad difference or is, is it Hollywood and China just truly now? And, and it's, it's, I don't know how to say like existentially, it's just so far and above these, you know, cultural differences of the, of, of uh, the political types it's over and above. And it's just, it's all great and all similar. I would say a significant proportion of 
China's film people. And that's everything from writers, actors, directors, cinematographers, you know, lighting, sound, all of them have spent some time studying overseas, you know, so they've been learning these skills and, and the technology is improving. Some of the best cameras I've ever worked with have been in China. You know, the Ari cameras are just fantastic. Um, steady cam work here is pretty standard now. Um, the main big, there's two big differences. Um, one, the audience, and there's, there's three different, so one, the audience is different. So like that TV series I'm doing right now is very cheesy soap opera because the intended audience is like, you know, 40 to 70 year old women in the countryside, right? It's not for young city goers. It's not for the cinema. It's a, you know, a, a cheesy TV series, which is why they want to campy and silly. And that's fine. Um, but you know, for the the bigger budget films or something like I, I did a pretty cool, slightly edgy film called Remain Silent, Walter Chamuo with Zhou Xun. And that was trying to sort of bridge that gap between Hong Kong and Chinese film audiences, which I think it did a pretty good job with. Um, and that film was probably the most. I mean, the 800 was definitely professional as well, but Walter Chamuo, um Remain Silent was like it, it acted more like a Hollywood film in that there were hours that you were on set. They treated you well. Food was available and good. There was, you know, um, just a little bit more respect for everyone, even members of the crew, like someone hurt themselves. And so everyone took a break so that that person could feel no pressure getting back on their feet. Um, versus in mainland China, because there are no unions everything is like the, the, the lack of respect for everyone is, I mean, like it, it's amazing to me with the exception of like maybe the most important people in the film. And, and so that's like maybe the head producer and head director, but everyone else is sort of treated a little bit like crap. Um, you're just a, a pawn in a giant chess game and you don't actually matter. That's the feeling that you're given, you know, um, the food is always really just, you know, it's, I mean, it's they, they're just trying to save money, you know, and they're feeding a lot of people. It's just a it's not a terribly pleasant experience versus when I've done films. Um, I've done like a Canadian film and some American stuff. Um, and then, you know, some international productions here in China is just so different, you know, in the way your time is valued and respected. So, you know, um, planning in advance. You know, I often say to Chinese people, it's not that Hollywood produces better films because Hollywood is better. It's that because Hollywood has a system, you know, the scheduling system, all of these things that make Hollywood films more expensive, that also means that they are of at least a certain quality. Now, I will, I would argue that most Hollywood films aren't even that really, aren't that good. They look good, but you know, the, the writing is often sort of meh, but you know, um, even so they, they produce something that people will spend money on because of that system. And China doesn't do that system yet. Maybe they will, you know, it's sort of, um, it's this unending struggle. I mean, even these big actors, they, you know, these people who are famous and important, blah, blah, blah. I mean, people will fawn over them on set, like, you know, calling, oh, master, so sorry, please, you know, have a seat, da, 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 da. But it's all sort of false because in the end, this person is still not terribly respected because their time isn't valued and, you know, switching things around. And it's just, it's all very, I don't know. I don't, I don't like the classist feeling of it often it makes me feel very like not even about me, but the way that like, you know, people will treat, um, other crew members, you know, or extras, you know, it's, um, unions are important. You know what? I, I love how <laughs> that's where we ended up with, with that, um, small piece talking about Chinese cinema is that unions are important. That's, that's the, that's the takeaway for the audience. Yeah. I mean, just, I mean, honestly, with the quality of writing, the quality of acting, everything, because when you have a, like I was on set last week, um, for more than 16 hours, right. On set in makeup, doing lines, like acting the whole time. It is not possible to emote 16 hours in a row and memorize new lines. You know, it wasn't just me that was struggling by the end. Everyone was. So then a scene that would have normally taken 10 minutes to film took more than an hour. And so it was just wasting everyone's time. But the thing, and so like, ultimately, again, this gets back to that concept of producing art as business and, and why I like star theater 
Um, and why I like the 800 is when people approach it, like this is a business, this is how we do things to be efficient and, um, you know, logistics matter. And I just can't, you know, for instance, this TV series, I went back to Shanghai. I didn't want to go because Shanghai was currently a red zone, like really like bad COVID zone, worst in China so far since like 2020. Um, and, uh, and I fought it the whole time, but they made me, they made me, I get there. There's a thing with the airplane. So I have to get on a later flight. So I don't get there until like one or two in the morning. And by then they already knew, but they hadn't told me the next day I wake up, go do costume and makeup at 5. AM. You know, I'm, I'm there. I'm ready. I'm professional. I'm, you know, um, and it's only midway through the day after I'm like, I need to go get a COVID test so I can get home tonight. They're like, oh, okay, go and do that. And I said, what time do I have to be back? When am I going to be doing it? And they're like, oh no, we actually aren't filming today because we had a problem with the, the set switch. And I'm like, really? You could have told me that. I'm like, yeah, we could have, but we just didn't know. It was a different person in, in charge. And, you know, and it was just like, I, I, I nearly murdered someone on Monday. Yeah, was, I, I agree. Uh, I, I've actually done a couple of commercials. Um, I did a, I did a yeah. lot of voiceover, surprise, surprise, uh, while I was in China for real estate construction or golf courses or other things. Mm, just their their yeah. English portions of the, you know, when they have their show homes and they, you know, things and they, mm -hmm. they would run, you mm -hmm. know, the English and the Chinese, whatever. So I spent, a, I spent time in studio in, in China as well. And I, I agree. Like they, you know, we were shooting this video, this, this commercial for the IT park outside of Dalian, Dalian, excuse me. Mm. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, it was all, I can get home till six o'clock in the morning. And we started at, you know, 8 a.m. the yeah. day before. It was just all night. We were sleeping on the, in the, in the corners and ordering in food and yeah. just waiting and waiting. And no, I literally slept on a, uh, uh, like part of the, the curtains for the stage at the world expo because we were rehearsing all night because the leaders decided they wanted to make a last minute change. You know me, and I have a five o'clock shadow, which was at full, like, you know, yeah. it, it was like midnight. By the yeah, but I, don't, I didn't even look like the same person yeah. yet. I guess I just wanted to make one point, um, and that's that this culture of sort of going by the seat of your pants is it's a benefit and a curse. It's one of the reasons Chinese startups actually can do so well with the changing environment around them, because there, there are no plans. So you just are always sort of pivoting constantly because you just, you're dealing with whatever is directly in front of you. And that again, it's, it's a, it's a benefit and a curse. There are, there are goods, good, good points to it and bad points. But I think that's sort of this metaphor for all of it. You know, every business I've ever done in China, anything I've ever been involved with, it's, you know, it's chabudo because you, you just, you keep moving forward and whatever you got to do, you'll find a way there's, you know, there's always a bamfa, right? Bamfa is one of those like, words that when you translate it into English, it becomes like there's always a method or a, a solution or something. But in Chinese, it's much more visceral. <laughs> like there's just there's where there's a will, there's a way. But then often you'll hear people say may banfa. So like there is no there is no banfa. There is no way to do it. And you're like, no, no, there's always a banfa. Right. There is. So. OK, that's where we'll end part one for now. Tune in next week for part two of our conversation with Elise Ribbons. Growing a company is hard. Doing it in a foreign market? Exponentially so. The best piece of advice I can give you is not to do it alone. When you start looking across the pond for further expansion possibilities, and I sincerely hope that you do, make sure you choose the right partners to do it with. My good friends at WPIC Marketing and Technologies have almost 20 years of experience helping brands just like yours enter China. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The Negotiation. And if you're interested in being a guest or want to connect with me or any of our team, please reach out to us at podcast at WPIC.co. And be sure to rate, comment, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Zai Jing.